without any further ado, um, obviously I'm going to be talking to you now for the next hour, um, and I'm going to be talking about discrimination case law, um, but particularly I'm going to be having a look at gender identity issues. Um, because gender identity issues are something that is coming to the fore in uh, case law and we're watching tribunals grapple uh, with gender identity issues in a way that perhaps they haven't been required to before. Um, so first of all, in terms of our agenda, um, so the, uh, the major update uh, or the major focus of the update is going to be on a case which is the Taylor and Jaguar Land Rover case. Um, now this is only at an employment tribunal level, so this isn't an, an appeal tribunal uh, level case, uh, but it's, it is a very important and I think a timely reminder that whilst, whilst the law in relation to discrimination might not be changing, the way that the, the law is applied and the, the context in which the, the law is applied as society changes and the way that society's attitude uh, to discrimination changes, um, obviously the decisions then reflect that, the decisions in, uh, in the employment tribunal then reflect that. Um, we're also going to be having a look at a, uh, the issues of gender identity and religion, but not just actually religion, that's a little bit misleading of me just to say the conflict between gender identity and religion, it's also to do with gender identity and beliefs as well. So I've got a couple of cases that we're going to have a look at where those conflicts arise. Um, and then we're going to turn to something that is quite rare, but uh, could become more common, which is the issue of interim relief and discrimination. And then finally, we'll just do a wrap up on a couple of cases in relation to cost justification in relation to discrimination and also training. Um, so we are all different. And I mean, that. <laughs> Of course we are. I mean, that, 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 I know that seems really obvious, but the heart of the you know sound business and the principle of equitable and fair treatment for employees, no matter what your characteristic is, is to recognise the fact that we are all different, but then treat everybody um, in the same way. So whether we are black or white, gay or straight, religious or not, men or women, disabled or not, pregnant or not, young or old or married or not, it, all of that should be entirely irrelevant to how we are treated at work. Um, and I know that's a very obvious and basic principle, but um, it is one that I think um, obviously still needs to be grappled with and people still need to be reminded of because people are still being unfairly discriminated at work because of these characteristics. Now, of course, some of these acts of discrimination can be unintended. They can be sometimes as a result of an unconscious bias. Um, they can be where somebody is just being really rather clumsy with what they're saying or what they're doing. But of course, what we've got to do as employers is to make sure that the possibility and the likelihood of that taking place um, is uh, greatly limited. Um, and we can do that obviously through training and policy documents, which I'll, I'll turn to a little bit later. But of course, Discrimination and the nature of society do, doesn't doesn't stand still. I mean, we have seen an awful lot of change over the past um, couple of years. We've seen the Me Too movement. We've seen Black Lives Matter, uh, and I think that employers are beginning to address and deal with those issues. Many employers are, big, are, are addressing and deals with those issues and have been um, before those. Um, before those movements in any event. But I think the next the next issue which employers perhaps haven't grappled with quite so well to date, but are going to have to in the future is gender identity. Um, now, an estimate, uh, and, and this is a rather rough estimate because the statistics are very difficult to obtain, but as a rough estimate, we're looking at about 1% of the working population that identifies trans, which equates to around about 300,000 workers. Um, but when I, I was obviously doing some research into, into some of this data, and there is also another data, uh, piece of data from uh, the Women and Equality Select Committee that reported to the government, albeit now five years ago, 
um, that identified there were 650,000 people are likely to be gender incongruent to some degree. And I don't know whether you might have seen it in the press at the beginning of the week, but there was a, a further report that identified that um, two thirds of trans workers believe that it is necessary to keep their identity a secret at work and that that figure has actually increased over the last five years. Um, and so that in itself, of course, is not good. It's a that is a, a worrying trend. And when we then have a look at the mental health issues that then uh, flow from the uh, the feeling of greater conflict that trans workers might have, the fact that they don't feel necessarily appropriately supported at work and they feel like they've got to keep their identity a secret, that therefore that's those are all issues and problems that employers are going to have to deal with over the coming years. So that's really the con sort of setting the scene, um, the, the context of the of the situation. So what does the law say? Um, well, let's have a look at that in uh, a little bit more detail. So you can see here that this is uh, Section 7 of the uh, Equality Act which says that a person is protected or they have the protected characteristic of gender reassignment if the person is proposing to undergo, is undergoing or has undergone a process. Now, this definition, uh, albeit from 2010, um, is a slightly amended definition that was originally introduced in 1999. The only thing that changed in 2010 is that it uh, inserted the words in or it, that removed the requirement for someone to have actually started a process. So you see here that on the second line of the first paragraph, it talks about um, if the person is proposing to undergo a process. Um, but of course, what that therefore doesn't do is that it doesn't really talk about, um, it doesn't deal with the, with the concept of gender fluidity. It, it, it seems to be a, a approaching um, the issue of gender identity in a, in a rather binary way. And of course, trans identity can be non-binary in character. Um, it can, can be fixed, it can be variable. Um, it can be somewhere, you know, a point along a continuum or a point on a spectrum, but somewhere between male and female, um, where somebody is non-gendered. Um, and so, and, and this pro, this was was real issue that was identified by the women's uh, Women and Equality Select Committee, which I referenced just a moment ago, um, back in 2016, in which they made 35 separate recommendations uh, to the government to try to help address um, uh, everyday transphobia in, in society, uh, but also uh, the workplace. And one of the things that they recommended was that we change the language that we use in legislation, um, and and particularly the the, the phrase uh, gender reassignment was they they thought a rather unhelpful one, but of course here we are five years later, and uh, and still no change has been made. But this issue of gender identity and gender fluidity, and the interpretation of the uh, definition in the Equality Act and the and the definition of gender reassignment was um, addressed in the uh, in the Jaguar Land Rover case, which. Um, I'm going to turn to in a second. But first of all, I just want to um, show you this slide, which I which I saw on Twitter, uh, this, this image on Twitter um, just a couple of weeks ago, which I thought was really quite powerful um, because this is this is one of those um, boards that you would see in a barrister's chambers where it lists all of the barristers now and um, of course, we know how traditional some of those environments uh, can be, but you can see here that uh, in this particular barrister's chambers, they have uh, an individual who's just joined who is not identifying as either male or female, and so therefore has used a, a different suffix for their name. Um, and of course, that's, uh, well, things like that, those, um, those images and those uh, notable steps that are taken by organisations to reflect the fact that people aren't necessarily uh, representing themselves as either a binary male or female, I think are really very important. Um, and, and I think that steps like that are very much welcome. But turning to the Taylor and Jaguar Land Rover case. So as I said, this, this is a, 
this is, I, I think, really quite a, a key and quite an interesting case um, that we've seen. So I've just run through some of the facts and some of the backgrounds to this case. So first of all, the claimant started with employment uh, in their employment with the uh, with Jaguar Land Rover back in 1998, progressed through the through the business. And, and as you can see, they were then employed as a senior engineer by 2016. Then in March 2017, the claimant then approached HR and told them that she was transgender, explaining to HR that she considered herself to be on part of a spectrum. Now, one of the uh, whilst whilst I talk about this case, I, I do talk about uh, Miss Taylor being uh, a she. Um, that is because by the time that the employment tribunal hearing was heard, uh, Miss Taylor identified completely as uh, a a female, and so that is why I'm referring it uh, to her in that way. At this stage of the case, back in March 2017, that wasn't the case. So she wasn't referring herself uh, to she. She was identifying herself as uh, as gender gender fluid um, and so then following the conversation that she had uh, with HR in March 2017 the following month she then sent an email to her manager um, to then inform him that she was gender fluid but had no plans for any surgical transition and then in May 2017 she then uh, told her manager that she was feeling an awful lot of anxiety about how she should dress for work and that she was intending to present herself in a mixed mode occasionally and that she would present herself as a passing woman. Now, just to explain what um, passing means, passing refers to a transgender person's ability to be perceived as the gender that they identify as and beyond that, not to be perceived as transgender. So it's 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 quite an interesting, um, well, uh, in, an in, interesting definition, and the, and again we need to understand the language that 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 sits behind uh, all of this in order to understand the way that people wish to present themselves. Um, then continuing on with the with with what happened. So end of May 2017. So you can see this is all happening in a relatively short time frame at this point. Um, the claimant gave a PowerPoint presentation to her manager to explain her um, to explain her situation and the issues that she considered would need addressing. So you can see from this that you know, it is clear that um, Miss Taylor is bright, proactive, open and addressing the issue of her gender. She's liaised with HR. She's talking to HR about setting up an LGBTQ plus um, support group. Um, she sat her manager down and given a PowerPoint presentation. But despite all of that, it is clearly evident that the company didn't know how to react, or at least her, her managers didn't know how to react, um, didn't know how to react to an employee who was gender fluid. They weren't able to provide her advice with what toilets to use other than to tell her to use the disabled toilets. And we'll, we'll turn on turn to the tribunal's conclusions on some of these points uh, in a moment. Um, the the fact that the establishing of the LBGT plus group was the claimant's idea and she appears to have done the majority of the work to, in getting the group established. Um, the company did allow her time to do this work and to establish this group, but this was very, very much done with a view that, uh, from the company's view, that it must not have a detrimental effect on her overall performance and output. For that reason, unsurprisingly, Ms. Taylor then spent almost all of the time that she spent on this group outside of her normal working hours. And she then felt, unsurprisingly, willingly, but not by not necessarily by choice, but that she'd become a poster girl for 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 the LGBT plus rights there. Now, Whilst being gender fluid, she dressed as a male on some days and on a female on others days. Um, but and that but the, the whole issue around how she should dress and the lack of guidance and the lack of support that she was getting from her from her managers and her colleagues was then causing her uh, a significant amount of anxiety, uh, as was the which toilets to use in the absence of gender neutral toilets. And 
And so despite this, so despite all of the efforts that she was making, um, which were quite clearly quite, you know, very considerable, um, setting up this group, sitting her manager down, explaining what needs to be done. She was very much the, the one who was who was sort of leading this process and, and trying to help the organization to help her. But despite this, um, there were a rather of un, a number of unfortunate um, comments that were made both by her manager uh, and by HR. Um, for example, she was told that she was not normal by her manager. She was told not to dress as a woman, uh, was told to use the disabled toilets. Um, they were effectively putting all of the decision making in her hands, which at first glance may appear like a very non-confrontational way of dealing with the issue from an employer's perspective, but it didn't work and it doesn't work. All it did was it simply placed a high degree of pressure and responsibility on her when she'd already highlighted the fact that it was causing her a considerable amount of anxiety as to how she should be uh, dealing with these issues. But it wasn't just the lack of guidance and lack of support that was causing her to get upset. She was also uh, subject to a number of comments that she perceived as offensive and upsetting to her. The type of comments made, um, I've repeated uh, here in, in context in the following slides, so that we can see the type of harassment that employees who are gender fluid and or going through a transition process can often be uh, subjected to. So as you can see here, um, the, the the comments from work colleagues, you know, including some really quite offensive comments, um, some also rather clumsy comments. Um, but then we then get down to the comments from HR, which I don't think necessarily are particularly helpful either. You know, being told not to be too sensitive and um, well, what else would you like them to call you really are um, well, I, I don't think even clumsy is uh, probably the, the appropriate way of putting it. Um, the claimant raised these concerns with uh, her managers, but essentially the approach that they took to it was, you've got to name names. Um, it, you are making these complaints about individuals who have made comments with you. We need to know who those individuals were and we need to know when those comments were made in order that we can take action. And in the absence of knowing um, who these people are, effectively the company was was saying we can't we can't deal with the problem. But of course, what that means is that the approach that was being taken was that it was being viewed simply as nothing other than a disciplinary matter. Um, rather than we've got to sort this problem out. Now, things then continued for uh, some time. She then finally resigned from her employment, um, gave in, gave her notice of her resignation, I should say, on the 10th of April 2018. Um, so just over a year on from uh, informing HR that uh, uh, that she was gender fluid. Um, this followed an announcement that was made in relation to a team structure where her name was omitted. Um, but it was also the fact that, as she gave in, uh, in her evidence to the tribunal, that this that was coupled with the fact that the company knew of all of this harassment that was occurring, that they had no plan to deal with it. And to, to quote the, the claimant, she said, they were watching me break. On the 21st of May, so just over a month after she handed in, in her resignation, um, she then, because she was working out her notice uh, point at this, at this point, she then raised some additional uh, complaints about some other comments that had been made to her, at which point her manager was, um, the, the tribunal concluded that her manager said no more. Um, and she also then asked to withdraw her notice, but her her request to withdraw her notice was then rejected by uh, uh, by the company. So she then brings her claims, and 
In bringing her claims, she brought claims for obviously for harassment, for victimization, uh, and also for constructive unfair dismissal. Now, one of the issues, one of the key issues, and this goes back to what I was saying before, one of the key issues that the tribunal then had to grapple with was um, on the basis that she had described herself as gender fluid, um, but with no intention of undergoing surgery. Did that actually afford her protection under Section 7 of the Equality Act? Um, which, of course, when we uh, when we had a look at that earlier, it talks about if the person is undergoing or has undergone a process for the purpose of reassigning the person's sex. And so, unsurprisingly, and, and I think quite appropriately, um, Jaguar Land Rover argued that Miss Taylor was not undergoing gender reassignment at that time because she was gender fluid and non-binary. And this then goes back to the issues that was all that were also raised in the uh, Women in Equality Select Committee report that um, I referred to earlier from 2015 that was saying this is a problem in terms of the way that the law looks at the protection um, that people uh, who are gender fluid uh, may have or you know that or at least there was there was a great uncertainty a lack of certainty in the law about whether in fact somebody who is gender fluid is protected by the gender reassignment uh, definition um i mean the tribunal did grapple with it they had a look through um uh, lots of various bits of information they looked through hansard solicitors general uh, solicitor general's comments um and essentially they concluded um that it's beyond doubt that someone in Miss Taylor's situation should be protected by the legislation because they are on the spectrum um, and and that if the intention of Parliament, notwithstanding the fact the definition of the law isn't necessarily clear, it was always the intention of Parliament to provide these individuals with protection. So she was protected in the law. Now, what I want to do is just have a look at some of the tribunal criticisms that uh, uh, that were made. Now, first of all, as I've, as I've just explained, the claimant was protected by the definition of gender reassignment. They also said that it was, to, and to quote, astounding that there was nothing in the way of proper support, training and enforcement on diversity and equality until the claimant raised the issue in 2017 bearing in mind how long the legislation has been in force. Essentially, the, the managers were very unclear about what policies the company had. Um, there wasn't even, rather embarrass, embarrassingly to start with um, uh, the case, there wasn't even an equalities, uh, equal opportunity, sorry, policy within the, bundle, within the trial bundle of documents. Um, the managers, uh, Although they were aware of a dignity at work policy, they didn't really know of it. They hadn't read it. They didn't necessarily understand it. They didn't act in accordance with it. They just simply sat back in a way and just relied on the advice um, from HR rather than being proactive themselves and, and knowing and understanding the policy. And also there was absolutely no evidence of any training that had been had taken place whatsoever, although some of the witnesses recalled some uh, uh, training having taken place a few years earlier, but there was no evidence of it. As I said, the tribunal were really very critical of um, of requiring the uh, Miss Taylor to uh, use the disabled toilets. They thought that this was highly inappropriate, um, that disabled toilets are for disabled people and that a company of this size should be making provision for gender neutral toilets. As I've said, they didn't like the, the approach uh, uh, in relation to the grievance of requiring the uh, re requiring the employee to name names, um, because essentially what the what uh, what the employee was saying, what Miss Taylor was saying, was that well, if I name names, then I'm just simply going to be subject to more uh, more inappropriate conduct. Um, they took an unacceptable approach to the claimant's welfare. They didn't provide enough support. The grievance took over six months to deal with, and during this time, she kept saying that she was. She was uh, uh, suffering from anxiety as a result of the pressure that was put on her to effectively be the be the poster case for um, for LGBTQ plus rights within the workforce. And so 
Yes, managers were completely out of their depth and not given appropriate support that the advice from HR was woeful and the culture of the business was not aligned to the respondents policy. So this is this, of course, then goes back to the whole issue of making sure that when you communicate these policies, that the managers understand the policies, that they read the policies, that they whenever they're dealing with issues of uh, of uh, equality, of dignity at work, at harassment, that they are reading the policy, that they of course get training on the policy. I mean, that's very much a, a given that that really should be happening. Um, and and it in this day and age, a tribunal, tri, well, a tribunal, tribunals are very critical of employers that have not undertaken the basic requirement of having a policy in place and making sure that all managers and supervisors are trained on those policies to make sure that that culture is embedded, to make sure that people understand um, what the business wants employees to do, what the business wants its managers to do. And so then turning to the actual judgment itself, so what was the outcome? Well, it was quite significant. Um, Jaguar Land Rover agreed to pay the sum of £180,000 in compensation. Um, they were ordered to pay an additional 25% of the claimant's legal costs, but then quite extraordinarily, um, the recommendations that were made were incredibly significant. Um, and it isn't often that you see recommendations being made, but and 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 it's or at least not in this uh, not in this sort of format. So as you can see, there was a recommendation, uh, a requirement uh, that the respondents board of directors, so Jaguar Land Rover's board of directors, read and discuss the written reasons of the judgment. Now the judgment is 59 pages long. It's obviously available on the uh, on the uh, tribunal website. So um, I will send a copy of the uh, judgment out to you along with the slide deck in any event with a few highlighted uh, highlighted sections within it uh, that I think are particularly relevant. But this judgment had to be read and discussed at the board meeting on or before the 1st of March 2021, so sometime this month. And then a copy of the minutes of that uh, meeting should then be provided to the claimant by the 15th of March. That the respondent then appoints one of its um, one of its uh, employees as a diversity inclusion champion. That they shall commission a report by a recognised diversity organisation such as Stonewall uh, to produce a report, essentially, and carry carry out an audit on their current equality equality position and the steps required for them to become a standard setting organization and thereafter for the next five years produce an annual report of progress against the uh, against the reference point of the original report and that that report is then provided to all employees it's made public and it's also sent to the claimant so some really significant um, recommendations here um, I say recommendations, requirements uh, that were placed upon business here. So as you can see that um, this this is a significant case, not just in terms of the fact that this is the uh, this was the first case that dealt with the, with the issue of gender fluidity. It also was incredibly critical of a business which didn't meet the basic requirements and was essentially pushing the requirements to sort to sort the uh, uh, sort the problem um, onto the employee, which really shouldn't have done. So what what is it that we need to do then? Um, what is it that we should be doing? Well, first of all, what we need to be doing is we need to be taking action and acting in accordance with your policy. So um, where there is harassment, obviously you need to take action. But then, of course, we then got into this whole issue of, well, the business then requiring her to name names. But there are other ways in which you can deal with these things if the if the individual isn't prepared to name names. Um, so, for example, the tribunal commented that it would have been entirely reasonable and appropriate for them to have taken a more nuanced approach to ensure that the message of equality and diversion and inclusion and issues relating to harassment were made. And so it could have issued a notice to employees highlighting some serious concerns that it had about 
uh, about particular behaviours and identify that those behaviours were completely unacceptable and would be taken seriously and result in disciplinary action. Um, this would then give comfort to those people who are complaining whilst also putting those who um, who may be exhibiting that behaviour that it is unacceptable and it's going to have potential consequences in the future. Um, and then, then that notice then makes clear reference back to the company's policies and perhaps is then backed up by, by training as well. So something as simple and straightforward as that then um, is another way of dealing dealing with the issue. Um, but of course, throughout this time, also you've got to make sure that you're providing appropriate support and guidance in, uh, to employees. You're helping them through the process and rather than necessarily just putting the, the focus on them to sort it out. Um, I mean, as the claimant said in her in her appeal, she said that having a chat doesn't help if it causes isolation and then places the burden on the victim to educate the leaders. Um, and that the approach that the business took to her um, setting up the LGBTQ plus group had been wearing and one sided. Um, and then turning to the policies, as I said, it was rather embarrassing for the company that the that all of the policies went within the document itself. Uh, sorry, within the trial bundle. Um, but make sure that you review your policies. Um, I would imagine that a number of uh, a number of you possibly aren't uh, aren't aren't going to have a policy that necessarily refers to somebody who may be gender fluid. Or, or may be transitioning, it might refer in passing to the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, but probably doesn't go a huge amount further than that. And so I think it's appropriate now for all employers to be having a look at their policies and to be updating their policies to appropriately reflect this issue. Um, and then, of course, you need to be training your managers in order to appropriately deal with those uh, with those policy changes and to make sure that then the culture of the business and the actions of the business then reflect those changes or alternatively of course actually have a separate policy to deal with with trans issues at work rather than actually just simply uh, amending the the policy that you've got at the moment and so that that really concludes where we are with the uh, uh, with the Taylor and Jaguar Land Rover case. So an important case. I like as I said, I will I will send a copy of the the actual judgment itself uh, to you afterwards. And I think it's well worth a read. It really is. Um, now I'm going to turn to a couple of cases where we begin to get conflict between gender identity issues and other people's beliefs. And the first case that I'm going to talk about is the four stater case. Now. The four stater case. Now, in this case, the claimant worked as a uh, visiting fellow at for the cent, uh, sorry, at the Centre for Global Development, and she worked there between 2015 and 2018 under a consultancy arrangement. Um, but then, at the end of 2018, the uh, the organisation then decided to uh, not continue to engage with her due to her gender critical opinions. Now you can see one of the tweets that um, uh, that she uh, put up on Twitter shown on this slide here. Now her views, Miss Forstater's views were was that sex was immutable. That is that sex cannot change and does not change. And therefore whatever a person's stated gender identity is, uh, or whatever their gender expression is. It was her belief, her view, that people are born to a particular sex and that that is a material reality and that the determination of sex could not be conflated or confused with gender identity or their gender. To put it simply, she believed that people are, are the sex that they were born as and, they, and that, that cannot be changed. And Whilst this is one of the tweets that uh, she put up, she was very active on Twitter, um, generally tweeting between uh, five and ten times a day on average. 
and a number of these tweets that she made where she was uh, stating her view in relation to uh, the, the fact that sex is immutable uh, was as a result of the uh, consultation that was being undertaken in relation to the Gender Recognition Act 2004, which I haven't spoken about in when I've been talking about the the, the other um, uh, the other legislation, well, I say the other legislation with, in, in relation to the Equality Act, because I've just been focusing in on employment. But whilst I'm still focusing in on employment, the issue was that she was raising these views as a result of the consultation that was going on in relation to the Gender Recognition Act. Um, and there are a number of other tweets that uh, Ms. Forstater posted that were along similar lines to the one that you can see here. So what she contended was that her belief that gender was indisputable amounted to a belief. Um, and of course, uh, belief is potentially a protected characteristic because um, religion and belief is a, uh, a protected characteristic. Now, the rules that are set out in relation to whether something is a protected belief or not um, were set out in this case of uh, Granger and Nicholson some 10 years ago and set out five uh, set criteria. And these criteria are that the belief must be genuinely held, that it must be a belief and not an opinion or a viewpoint, it must be a belief which is weighty and substantial aspect of human life and so on and so forth, and then finally, it must be worthy of respect in a democratic society. Now, the tribunal, as you can see from this slide, and I'm not going to go through all of the all of the various bits of this slide, but as you can see, the tribunal then went off and had a look at various uh, various pieces of legislation that dealt with particularly this whole issue of the protections that are afforded to individuals not to be discriminated against and this uh, and the right essentially of free speech, the the, the right to exercise freedoms, um, but the right to exercise freedoms within um, a context that it carries with that right, duties and responsibilities, which then may be uh, subject to, to restrictions. And so what the tribunal concluded was that whilst she met the first four tests in the Granger and Nicholson case, she failed on the final criteria, which was in relation to having the, uh, the belief having uh, respect within a democratic society. And so essentially what they were saying was that her belief was incompatible with human dignity and the rights of others. And they were particularly critical of Miss Forstater's view that even if a trans woman is legally recognised as being a woman through the holding of a gender recognition certificate under the Gender Recognition Act, she could not truly describe herself as a woman. And so they concluded that even though Miss Forstater had a qualified right to freedom of expression under human rights legislation, it was legitimate to exclude her belief from the protection that could have been afforded to her under the Equality Act because her views harmed the rights of others. Now we are going to have to keep a little bit of an eye on this case because it, an appeal has been lodged to go up to the Employment Appeal Tribunal. So we will wait and see whether this uh, changes because again, this is uh, at Employment Tribunal level as well. Now, another case which deals with this conflict between um, or the conflict that can sometimes arise between uh, somebody's belief or their religion uh, and the issue of gender identity. Now, this one um, is in relation to the conflict between religion and, uh, and transgender. So, in a similar way, this is also at employment tribunal level. So we're talking an awful lot about employment tribunal level cases, which I appreciate don't have the binding authority on other employment tribunals, but um, but they are, I, I believe they're very interesting to show the direction of travel and, and the way that um, the courts are dealing with these issues. So, Dr. Makareth, so this is one of these cases where Again, we get into conflict between these two protected characteristics. And Dr. Makareth stated that his belief 
was that a person cannot change their sex or gender at will. Um, and any pretense of doing so is pointless, self-destructful and sinful. Um, he went on to say that he had a lack of belief in transgenderism because it was, in his view, impossible to change sex or gender and linked that to his belief in Genesis, in the book of Genesis. Um, that impersonating the opposite sex may be beneficial. Sorry, he didn't believe that the uh, impersonation of the opposite sex is beneficial for an individual's welfare. He didn't believe that society should accommodate or encourage anyone's impersonation of the opposite sex. And um, he had a conscientious objection to transgenderism. Um, he then brought claims that uh, was in relation to uh, pressure on him, pressure that was placed on him at work uh, to renounce his belief uh, his suspension from work on the 13th of June 2018 and then subsequently his dismissal from work. Um, and the employer, of course, I mean, they accepted that uh, Dr. Macareth was a Christian, but they did not accept that the beliefs that he had were protected. And unsurprisingly, the conclusion of the tribunal was that, um, again, when we turn to that final bullet point of uh, Granger and Nicholson, was that he didn't, um, he wasn't afforded the protection uh, under the religion and belief protection simply because it was not consistent with the protection that uh, is rightly afforded to uh, to people, to uh, to transgender people in relation to their gender identity. And and so this was uh, a, another case which then went the same way as the the four stater case. And so we can see that there is a clear direction of travel in this regard from uh, from the courts. And so um, really that I mean, that concludes the gender identity section uh, that we are ha all having a look at. And we are now going to be turning to uh, interim relief. Now interim relief. So. Interim relief is an interesting, uh, interesting concept, an interesting legal principle, and I'm just going to very quickly take you through what interim relief is and the protections that are afforded to people. So interim relief is a unique application that is made. It's, it's, a, it's an urgent application that is made to an employment tribunal and effectively allows a dismissed employee to be reinstated and continue, therefore, continue to get paid until their main claim is then heard by the tribunal. At the moment, the right to bring these claims, these interim relief claims, is only available in claims concerning employee representatives, including pension trustees, whistleblowing and trade union membership. It doesn't apply in discrimination cases at the moment. In terms of the procedure, um, it is uh, an emergency application that is made. So as you can see here, uh, there is a requirement to for someone to get their application, their tribunal application into the tribunal within seven days of the date of dismissal. The tribunal then uh, has an emergency hearing. And then the individual is then potentially reinstated into their role pending the later full hearing of the tribunal if their case looks like a winner, which is obviously one of those very clear legal tests uh, that, that that is used, and effectively, what it, what the tribunal uh, uh, is saying, or what the, that case law is saying, there is that the the bar is set quite high for a tribunal to actually conclude that it is right and appropriate for somebody to be reinstated into their job, pending the uh, uh, pending the outcome of the full hearing, um, and the burden of proof proof is on the claimant to show that their case is a winner or looks like a winner. Now, the reason that this is important in relation to uh, in, in relation to discrimination is because of this case of Steer and Stormshaw. Now, Miss Steer brought a claim in the Employment Tribunal against her employer, claiming that her dismissal had been discriminatory 
um, and that she had been victimised, and she made an application for interim relief. Now, as I just set out to you on the on the first slide, there is nothing in law that enables her to make that application. And so then what the Employment Appeal Tribunal then had to do um, was they had to have a look at all of the European law. So they had a look at um, Article 6 uh, of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, uh, which looks at the right to a fair trial, the right to respect private life and the prohibition of discrimination. And they were try essentially grappling with whether in fact that there is a justification for there being a difference between whistleblowing claims where interim relief is available and discrimination claims where interim relief is not available. And they considered that no legitimate aim was advanced for the different in treatment. But they felt that there was they couldn't have, they didn't have jurisdiction as the Employment Appeal Tribunal to actually come to a conclusion um, or to grant a declaration of incompatibility with, uh, with the Human Rights Act of 1998. And it would be wrong for them to apply uh, for a conforming interpretation to the Equality Act. And what I mean by that is essentially say that the they 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 considered that they were not able, they didn't have the authority to say that actually we interpret the Equality Act in a particular way that should enable you to bring your claim of interim relief. But what they did say was that this case needs to be uh, taken to the Court of Appeal who would potentially have that jurisdiction to come to such a conclusion. And so this case is now going to the Court of Appeal uh, in May uh, 2021, uh, so quite shortly. Quite When we will get the outcome of that, I'm not entirely clear because for those of you who have been uh, keeping an eye on how long it's been taking uh, some of the courts to hand down judgments, um, prob likely as a result of the pandemic, but it has been taking some time in some instances for judgments to be handed down. Um, so it's not that we will be getting an outcome in May 2021, it will be some time after that. But this could be a game changer for discrimination cases and, and particularly discrimination claims because it's going to uh, potentially put employers at much greater risk, uh, in certainly uh, in, in terms of initial financial impact of claims that are then brought if individuals are then able to get reinstated. Uh, so do keep your eye out for that case in the coming months. Um, obviously, we will keep you updated. Uh, should a decision be reached, or should I say when a decision is reached. Now, keeping with the theme of uh, discrimination, now one of the, going back to the Taylor and Jaguar Land Rover case, of course, one of the criticisms that was, one of the significant criticisms that was um, put to Jaguar Land Rover was that its, uh, its provision of training was entirely inadequate, it, essentially, meaning that none of the managerial witnesses who appeared at the tribunal could actually remember the last time that they had training, which um, wasn't particularly helpful uh, for their case. Now, this latest case of um, Ally, that what this case does is it actually deals with uh, the, essentially the reasonable steps defence. So what the reasonable steps defence says in the Equality Act, which is section 109 of the Equality Act, it says that if an employer has taken all reasonable steps to prevent the discrimination from taking place, then it can avoid liability. So this would be in circumstances where, say, for example, employee A has harassed employee B and then brings a claim against the employer, sorry, a claim is then brought against the employer for that harassment. One of the things the employer can say under section 109 is that, hey, we've done everything we can possibly do to prevent employee A from harassing employee B. We've got the policy in place, we've communicated the policy, we've trained people on the policy, we've trained employee A on the policy. They understand not to do this, they know not to do this, they shouldn't have done it, and yet they've still gone ahead and done it. So therefore we can't as an employer be held liable for that. That is what the reasonable steps defence is. Um, now what the case of Ally then begins to do is it then begins to have a look at well, how, how high is the bar set here in terms of um, in, in this specific instance where we were having, a, in this case it involved racial banter, 
it was as to whether the training was adequate or not. Now, the training itself had been undertaken um, just over two years before um, Mr. Ally had uh, joined. So the diversity training had taken place in uh, February 2015. And so it was about three years old at the at the point in time when uh, the uh, when the harassment took place. And what the tribunal concluded was that it was old, that it was stale, that the examples used within the training were outdated. Um, and so therefore, given given that, the employer was not able to rely upon the reasonable steps defense because the because the training wasn't adequate to uh, to to fulfill the um, to fulfill the, the the requirement of section 18 sorry 109 which is all about taking such steps as, as were reasonably practical and they said the, the training just wasn't sufficient enough and so what this does do is it sort of highlights the need for you to keep your training under review for you to be updating your training and for example i mean if if i think about the training that i've conducted over over the past years that when i look back say um three four years ago because of the changes that we've had with me too with black lives matter and now with gender identity issues that actually things move on and the examples that are given within training then change quite quickly and need to be constantly updated so i would certainly encourage you to be um, to be reviewing your training provision and reviewing your training content to make sure that it remains up to date and relevant. And then finally, the final case um, that I'm going to be having a look at is cost justification in, uh, in discrimination. Now, cost justification in discrimination cases. Um, now, this is about the... Um, essentially this third bullet point on the slide. So in an indirect uh, discrimination claim, one of the things that an employer can do is, of course, justify uh, the, uh, the difference in treatment uh, by showing that it's a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim, which is effectively known as the objective justification defence. And of course, one of the factors that often comes to the for when we're looking at that objective objective justification defense is cost how much does it cost to um to accommodate um the or to remove the difference in treatment and and so we've got, there are a couple of cases here which i won't um go into the minute detail of uh, of these cases but you can see that uh, uh that essentially what what these cases did was it introduced what was called the cost plus rule which effectively meant that employers could not solely on the ground of costs avoid uh, uh, avoid or couldn't justify discrimination so you can't justify discrimination simply on the basis of cost that is what those those cases say now in terms of the facts of the uh, Heskett case what we've got is that in 2010 due to the uh, economic recession the treasury announced a policy limiting pay increases and so as a result of that change in the uh, in those pay increases and essentially the progression through the, the pay band it would have taken mr hesker 23 years to progress from the bottom to the top of his pay band rather than seven or eight years and so therefore his view was that as long as this new policy persisted older employees would be earning who were therefore near near the top of the band would be earning significantly more in salary and also be accruing more uh, in pension benefits than those lower down the band and that therefore that the change in the pay banding placed him and those under the age of uh, uh, 50 at a significant disadvantage because of the speed at which they would progress through the pay banding or should I say the lack of speed that they would be progressing through the, the pay banding. Now I mean what the tribunal concluded here was that it was 
it was quite a nuanced um, decision. It was effectively saying that, well, yes, in some extreme cases, an employer may be able to rely on um, rely on cost on its own um, as a justification, uh, but that it would have to be in for them to be relying upon cost on its own. Um, the impact on the organization would really have to be very, very significant indeed um, uh, to do so. So what we are effectively looking at is that um, and we're still looking at a cost plus label here is really what I'm saying is that, is that whilst this does open up um, the possibility of using cost only as an argument, it is going to be in the more extreme cases. But it also might mean um, that actually in terms of the cost plus, well, to what extent does there have to be the plus? How important does the plus need to be? Is the bar actually generally being lowered here for employers in relation to the other factors that must be taken into consideration here? Um, so an, int an interesting case. It certainly doesn't fundamentally change, I think, but might make it a little bit more helpful for employees as we uh, as we progress and we deal with issues um, where perhaps we have got um, uh, cost uh, issues as consideration. And, and, and perhaps you never know, it might be that we're going to perhaps come across a lot more of these cost considerations as we have as we move to um, I say we move to as we possibly or a lot of the people are going to move to home working and whether in fact and to what extent there's going to be the requirement for employers to be providing uh, equipment for people to be working from home and particularly say for example uh, uh, disabled employees who might be needing uh, specific equipment for being able to work at home as well. So all of these sorts of things might be coming to the fore and the cost plus rule therefore might be uh, might be becoming quite important in those cases. Um, so yes, pretty much on time. I'm, I'm, I didn't do a dry run of this. I was hoping that this would run to about an hour. I'm very pleased that it has done so. Um, thank you all very much for uh, attending. Please do keep an eye on uh, our podcast page because as I said, we will be uh, putting up a new podcasts there on a regular basis. So if you prefer to listen to your updates rather than uh, sitting down and watching them, um, then please do download those. Um, we have, of course, got our updates that we put on YouTube as well, and uh, this will be put up there a little bit later on. So we do have uh, those updates which aren't, uh, which we don't broadcast live as webinars. Uh, so they will be um, uh, on YouTube. Those links, of course, were in your, uh, in your email that I sent to you. As I said, after this session, I will be sending you an email that has the slide deck and also the uh, the Jaguar Land Rover case decision for you as well. Um, so if you want to have a particular read of that, then do so. We are going to be updating our template diversity policies uh, to reflect uh, the, uh, the, the changing context in relation to gender identity. And I'll be encouraging you to be updating your policies as well. But really, that concludes our webinar. I do hope you found that useful. Um, please do get in touch if you've got any questions uh, at, at any time. And uh, uh, and yes, take care and hope to hope to see you all again sometime soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.